Hello my friends, welcome back. I'm JC and this is Grace Overflowing. In today's video, I have a lot to share. Some amazing things that the Lord has been revealing to me over the last couple of weeks. And I will say that it has been a lot. And in some ways it has been completely overwhelming because of the way that it shows the deception in this world and how widespread it is. And it's absolutely rife, my friends. And so I feel that he has brought me here to share this information because it doesn't necessarily change the past, but it certainly does provide an indication of where we are. And it also provides a warning about where we're going and potentially how quickly things might change. And that is, in a nutshell, what he's been showing me. And I want to share this message with you, but before I do, I want to say that I want you all to take it to the Lord in prayer for yourself for understanding to also search these matters out for yourself, confirm these things for yourself if you're feeling conflicted in the spirit. But as it is, there's just been some supernatural revealings. And I do believe that he has shaken me hard because even though I have not really wanted to come and share this message, it is a hard message. It's probably the hardest message I've ever given up to this point. I do believe that he is having me come here and give it as a warning and as a way of shining light into so much darkness that is out there right now, my friends. And so with that, I want to speak into a lie, a lie that is hidden in plain sight, a lie that is in accordance to how Satan deceives, a lie that once exposed and you see the truth, it seems so obvious, but still somehow all this time for me and most people, most Christians even, We've never been able to connect the dots on this. In fact, I have seen evidence that only few people seem to have come to this understanding, putting these dots together for themselves. And I'll tell you, I think it is for a reason. You know, Satan is a deceiver, Satan lies, but God uses it all. And he has a purpose in allowing these things. And that's why it's very significant to us right now and where we are. And so with that, I want to say that the lie has to do with the third temple. Now, most of us have heard all of our lives as it relates to any teaching that we've heard on the book of Revelation, that the third temple is to come and that ultimately the Antichrist is going to build it and he's going to deceive the Jews in Israel. And then halfway through the tribulation period, he is going to walk up in there and he's going to sit down and declare himself God in that temple. And what the Lord has shown me in a very mind blowing way is that the third temple, my friends, has already been built and yet no one seems to want to address the elephant in the room and somehow this elephant has been under the rug and no one has been any the wiser most people have not known that if you look this subject up on any search engine, if you look on any basic website, um, online encyclopedia, Wikipedia, anything from you know that to even articles on Jerusalem Post, all of the general information is that the second temple, which was Zerubbabel's temple, was built onto, it was expanded, it was refurbished by Herod the Great. Yet, if you really look into the historical writings related to this very subject, what you discover is that Herod the Great had deceived the people. He had deceived them into allowing him to tear the holy temple down, the same one that we read about in the book of Haggai, um, Ezra, and Nehemiah. He tore that holy temple down and he built a new temple. And I have confirmed this with more than one reliable source. And so I will 
put those sources in the description box so anyone who wants to look into this further may do so. There was a historian that was writing at that time, Josephus, and so a lot of this truth can be found in some of his writings as well as other writings of that time. But beyond that, my friends, it just makes sense. You know, you had Solomon's grand temple, okay, that was torn down. You know, the Jews went into captivity. Then when they came out, the Lord summoned the second temple to be built. It was a modest temple and it was in the spot where the temple was supposed to be. And then somehow you have this additional Herod's temple. So it was Herod the Great who ultimately um, commissioned this third temple to be built you have him coming in and it does not make sense that you can build something on the scale of what it was that he built and it be totally an add-on and i had seen a video that shows the step-by-step -step, you know process of how this actual third temple herod's temple was built and it did not include an adding on to the holy temple that god had commissioned and that was prophesied and spoken about in the Old Testament. It was torn down, my friends, and it's so relevant to us and where we could possibly be right now because of the fact that I believe very much that this could be the type and the shadow of Antichrist as it relates to the final Antichrist and his mark and I'm going to explain in this video even though it may be a longer video I encourage you to watch the end and listen to the end because there's a lot here and I want to present it to you for your own prayerful consideration but I believe that it could definitely be a template a type and a shadow of the future Antichrist to come not like what everybody seems to connect it with which is Antiochus Epiphanes and what he had done to that second temple. By and large, most people, and myself included, believed that Jesus Christ himself went into that temple, the temple that had been built by Zerubbabel, the temple that had been defiled by Antiochus Epiphanes. But the reality of it is, my friends, is that there is no such thing as a second, second temple. The point is, is that the Jews right now are waiting and anticipating a third temple. And the ironic thing is, is that they've already had it and it has been burned down. And so with that, it's almost as if someone doesn't want this information known. Obviously, the Jews are not going to necessarily want this information out there. Obviously, they're probably going to want to um, minimize their error because in the end by allowing Herod the Great to build this temple they ultimately sold themselves out to Rome and Rome via Titus's army were the very ones that ended up not only burning down that third temple but also Jerusalem and so obviously the Jews are not going to want to take this on and really present this truthfully because unfortunately it's it's sad and it's 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 a horrible mistake and it would be much easier for them to consider that the second second temple but the reality and the facts speak for themselves and so at this point i want to speak into how that connects to the christians and that is that this man herod the great was the very same man who ultimately tried to kill the baby jesus and in the process killed thousands and therefore we can know that this man was an antichrist and he was against our savior jesus christ our messiah and he was trying to kill him from the time he was born and so what we must then deduce is that regardless of whatever information is out there, 
because there is information about one of the um, religious figures having a conversation with Herod and there was an indication that perhaps God had ordained this or was somehow behind Herod quote-unquote bringing light into the world. We as Christians just have to know that if we know the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, we know that the Lord would not commission and oversee and build a temple with someone who is ultimately going to try to kill his one and only son, an antichrist. Because not only is God the Father foreknowing and knew that Herod ultimately would try to kill Jesus, but that, you know, this temple would ultimately be called by a different name. Anybody who documents it correctly knows that it's referred to very prevalently as Herod's temple. His purpose in doing it was really to create a building project legacy for himself. And so he was able to do that by tricking the Jews into surrendering their holy temple and allowing him to build something that was really for his own crowning glory. And one of the videos that I am going to link for you to watch about all of this, that is actually the title of the video. It's called Herod's Temple, His Crowning Glory. And so we just have to understand how that potentially connects to anything and everything we read in Revelation, but specifically Revelation 13. Also, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, that word in the Strong's Concordance, exalt, it means to lift or to raise over, to lift oneself, and sets himself up in that word sets. It can figuratively mean a point, to have fixed one's abode, to sojourn, or to settle, to settle down in, meaning to hover or dwell, or to tarry. And so obviously there is some literal and very figurative ways that we can interpret this word. And I just want to say that Herod the Great and this third temple that is the third temple that was built by an antichrist did fulfill this scripture even in the past. So then it becomes a type and a shadow. And scripturally, we see that everything that has been done will be done again. And so I want to speak into quickly the two ways that this scripture has been fulfilled by this third temple and how it connects to the future prophecy that we had been given through the book of Revelation, Revelation 13. And the first way that it had accomplished that is that all people flocked to this temple. There are writings that compare it to snow-capped mountaintops. It was so grand and so beautiful and so pure looking. The way that they had covered it, I think whitewashed it with something, but it just looked like, you know, a beautiful snow-capped mountain from a distance. And all people flock to it, Jews and Gentiles alike. And what is interesting is that there was an outer court for Gentiles and the innermost courts were just specifically for Jews and the very center was basically the holy place where only the priests could go. But the reality of building it this way is the equivalent of combining the sacred and holy with what was not sacred and holy. And again, you have to go back to the actual Bible itself and ask yourself, well, why was the temple built and what was it for? And so there was a lot of buying and selling that happened in this outer court where the Gentiles were able to come to. And this was the very location where Jesus overturned the money tables. That was never a part of God's original plan for the temple. That was never a part 
of what the temple was supposed to be. This was the work of a man. And that man, his name is Herod the Great. And so it wasn't just for the Jews. It was just for everyone. And beyond that, it was for his own glory. And we see that Solomon's temple, there's no indication, you know, and from what I've seen, um, everybody agrees that there was no outer court in Solomon's temple, nor was there in Zerubbabel's temple because it was more modest than even Solomon's. And so the interesting part is prophetically, again, what we see in Revelation 11 is that John is given a reed and told to measure the temple, but not to measure the outer court. And so that's a big clue. That is a big sign that that, again, is, is not holy. And again, this has nothing to do with Gentiles and all that Jesus did after he came and the message of the gospel that went out to the Gentiles. We have to understand that that hadn't happened yet. And even still, what is sacred and what is um, holy should never be mixed with what is not sacred and holy. And in that way, making it literally a marketplace is just not God's plan. And so I think that we as Christians can just deduce because of all of these things that this was not a heavenly sent ordained temple. That what happened happened because the Jews were deceived and they ended up selling themselves into the hand of a snake, a snake in the grass, someone who is deceptive and someone who should never have been trusted and worked for Rome all along. And I will speak more into that subject in just a moment. But before I do, I want to speak into the second way, this third temple, legitimately third temple in the past fulfilled this verse from 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. And that is that at the very end of his life, Herod showed his true colors by mounting a golden eagle on the outer gates of the temple. And this was an outward sign of not only his own personal allegiance to Rome, because somehow the eagle was their symbol, but also as a symbol of their sovereignty over Jerusalem. And like I said, it's just very interesting that in the end, the temple was burned down by Rome and Titus's army and also Jerusalem. So we see the direct consequence of this error, this very grave error, because I think that it was. And so I had found this written online and unfortunately I'm realizing now that I did not list a source, but if I'm able to find that, I will list that also in the description box. But this was what was written about Herod the Great, it said, officially, he may have been called an allied king, but he was very much a vassal to the Roman Empire, and he was meant to rule and work for the greater glory of the Romans. And so we see that even though he communicated his intent to kind of make some wrongs right and to kind of bring some light and as a way of appeasing and pleasing his subjects, which were the Jews, we see that there is a bigger narrative and really his loyalty was not to them at all. His loyalty was to Rome, but they just believed the lie that he was for them and that the temple was for them. Okay, now with all of that said, I now need to shift into how this pertains to us today, how it could potentially pertain to us today. And before I get started on that, I want to read a couple of scriptures. First from 1 Corinthians 3.16, which says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? And meanwhile, on the subject, Jesus had said, Destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. And you can find that in John chapter 2, verse 19. We have to be very aware as Christians that once Jesus came and he became the temple, and then thus we became the temple, that it is very, very possible, my friends, that there will be no physical structures after that. After that point, that shift had been made and Jesus had declared it. 
And therefore, we have to understand that as it relates to this trickery that happened related to the quote unquote third temple that has already come and gone, that they are currently waiting for, that we as the church may be under the same deception, that we're waiting for something that has potentially already come and gone. We're waiting for something that is going to be physical and is going to be able to be seen with the eyes and fall into this same pattern of Solomon's temple and Zerubbabel's temple. But what we don't realize is that the minute Jesus said that he was the temple, which the Pharisees totally did not get, they thought he was talking about the physical temple at that point had been in the process of being built for 46 years and they worked on it beyond that. I think it was, I read around 80 years that they had worked on it because it was so grand. And I think that it was burned down like not there long after, like maybe seven or 10 years, somewhere along that line. So this third temple came at the very end of the second temple period. Zerubbabel's temple stood for a very, very long time. Herod's temple did not come until the very end. And then right as it was built, pretty much it was taken out. It didn't have a long life at all. And it definitely didn't accomplish Herod's dream, which was standing as his life legacy. And beyond that, I'll say that related to this subject, um, Jesus said related to Herod Antipas, who was Herod the Great's son. He said, go ye and tell that fox, behold, I cast out devils and do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Now, what's interesting is that the Pharisees had warned Jesus or told him that, you know, Antipas was going to try to kill him. And what I believe happened here was just a very subtle hint that Jesus was giving us even now in this day by calling him a fox, because that is a very loaded statement. It wasn't a compliment at all. And what a fox is, is very cunning, very deceitful. He is crafty. He has skill in achieving his end and his desire through the art of deception and furthermore dishonest. And so Jesus with that word, as it related to this entire family really, was very significant. And so as a really amazing confirmation, it seemed the very day that the Lord had been pouring all of this into me and I'm discovering all of this over the course of a couple of days, but specifically that day, just happened to be the ninth of all. And later that day, I had seen where there was a fox that was seen on the Temple Mount area. And strangely, ironically, the Jews perceived this as a huge sign of not only their coming Messiah, but also the rebuilding of the third temple, which is somehow connected, not just to Bible prophecy, but also somehow through the Talmud, I believe it's called. And so this just seemed like a really kind of amazing thing. And then I looked into it further and found out that apparently, in 2019, right before the 9th of Av, some foxes were also seen. And that timeline did not seem coincidental, my friends, with where the Lord had started to bring me with some of this revelation and how it potentially connected with all of the widespread deception that has been going on in our world, our entire world, since 2019, but more specifically, 2020. And so that's been you know, three years. I want to now shift into a topic that may make a lot of people uncomfortable. And it's not one that's been easy for me to deal with. I've been battling this. I've been seeking the Lord on this for a long time. I've been speaking warnings about this subject for a long time. I had received a lot of prophetic dream warnings that I had started sharing from very early on, you know, before a lot of people were sharing on this. And so I just want to say that take it for what it's worth. Take it to the Lord. You know, don't believe my word on it. 
but I just have to share what the Lord has given me on this. And I'm just going to ask you to do the rest of that working out with him personally. So the first thing that seemed very significant and how it could connect to the program, if you know what I'm saying, was that we all know that America, who was the creator of that thing, their symbol is the eagle. And, you know, the fact that Herod the Great put an eagle over the gates, it just seemed to me to be an instant connection that this somehow could tie to a future event that would pertain to America, who basically sold their poison to everyone. It was brought into the world through a program called Warp Speed. And we saw from very early on that the number one participant, actually, I think they had somehow brokered a deal in order to make this so. Um, the Jews and Israel were the first people to receive this. And so for the longest time, they were leading the world pack in number of participants and acceptors, if you will, of this thing. And so I had been seeking the Lord for more understanding because it just seemed to me that even though everything looks a little bit like it's settled down in that category, but beyond that, the world is on fire and it's evil to the max. And it just seems like I don't know how long things could continue on this level because it's bad. You know, I say that never having really watched any scary movies. I mean, I think we're so inundated with some of this and we are conditioned on some level to expect the apocalypse to look like some sci-fi movie. And I'm not saying that it won't get to that level, but I'm just saying that it does seem possible that we could be expecting, you know, something that is from a sci-fi movie, but yet we could be in the midst of all of this, you know, even now. And so at this point, I want to emphasize my friends that the Jews freely turned their holy temple over to an antichrist freely. And it had been his, and it had been Rome's all along, but they were none the wiser until Herod put the mark on the temple, his insignia, if you will, his symbol, the symbol of Rome, that they had been deceived. And so while I think it's very possible that there is something that is coming that will be very much a type and shadow of that, I think it's also very possible that the selling out to the devil and selling one's temple and handing that temple over could have also already happened just in the same way that it did in this situation. You know, we have to understand that Satan is tricky and this is a situation. I'm not trying to make fun of the Jews. I'm not trying to be hard on the Jews, but we see from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, you know, there was a serpent. There was a truth that was given, God's truth, and there was a serpent that spoke to Eve and deceived her. You know, I just want to say that I am deceived every day by Satan. I fall for his tricks. You know, I'm not perfect. I'm human. But I will say that as it relates to this, I believe biblically we see that that was very against all that is true in the Holy Bible. That is true within the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, which the Jews used. And so I do believe that they should have seen that deception coming before, that they should not have been willing to turn their temple over to someone just in order to get something that from a worldly standpoint was very grand and lavish and rich and bringing them some of the glory perhaps that we know that the Pharisees are always and have always desired. You know, God cares nothing about a grand temple. God cares about obedience. That is the truth of the Holy Bible. That is the truth of the first five chapters of the Old Testament. And so we just have to remember that. And we also have to remember that God tests us 
scripturally we see, I mean, read the book of Job. He tests us every day. There's constantly temptation by Satan and there's constantly testing. And this is for a purpose. You know, this grows us. This should make us run to God, seeking his word, desiring his word, searching these matters out in order to know the truth. The Holy Spirit speaks to us, but we have to know God. And the only way we can really know on some of these things that are more tricky, you know, in these ways that Satan deceives is literally by knowing his word because we see in the temptation of Jesus that Satan quotes scripture and he changes it ever so slightly. And so there can be major implications. I mean, obviously in the Bible, it says that anytime you follow a false god, it creates a snare and it is very harmful and there are consequences to that. And there were, there were consequences because once those people saw that blasphemous mark being put on their temple, a group of young people, I think they were men, um, rallied and tore it down and cut it to pieces with axes. And as a way of revolting against that, those men were literally sacrificed. They were burned alive by Herod the Great. And so what I started to see was how quickly things shifted. The minutes that physical mark was brought out and how quickly things changed once that mark was put in place. And I started to understand and feel that we could be at a very similar place in time, my friends, that once it got to that point, we could be much closer to the end than many of us have been thinking. And I won't speak into that at large, but I just will say this, like, I understand that we are at 2023 and how, you know, to close out this whole 6,000 year time period, you know, there's seven years remaining, how perfect that is and how nothing in the Bible is random. But I just started realizing that God knows the beginning from the end. He is the alpha and the omega. And I started thinking, wow, could it really be possible that somehow, and I'm not going to quantify that, that we're just so much further down that path. If you read Revelation 13 and the time periods that are given there, but also could it be even possible that God in his glorious wisdom would make it so that the end happens at the beginning? You know, that is something that I don't necessarily have the answer for my friend, but the idea of it, I have to admit, just made my heart just flip in my chest. And even now I feel that that is, you know, a grand possibility with the God of the universe. And the reason it is, is because he looks at a man's heart. And so it would be too obvious for the last seven years to be the last seven years. What if he was really wanting to look at man's heart? What if he was really going to test us? You know, wouldn't it be awesome of him to have all of his people watching and waiting and anticipating this rapture and thinking, oh, you know, no matter how bad things are, it's going to potentially get worse. And so we're in a place of Thanksgiving. We're in a place of anticipation. We're watching and we're waiting. But what if we've already been through it? You know, in Samuel, first Samuel, it says, you know, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so what if the mark really has less to do with anything physical that can be seen? We know from scripture that in the past, when these things have been mentioned, you know, it's like the word of God is said to be a mark. It should be a mark in between the front lips of your eyes and on your hands. In the book of Ezekiel, we see a mark that was placed on the righteous and it was invisible. And so this was just along the lines of where the Lord had brought me with all of this. And then I feel that something very profound came to my spirit, my heart, my mind, my thinking, and I couldn't shake it. I have to be honest, it was something that I'd questioned before, but in this moment, it just seemed especially piercing as it related to how I resonated with this in my spirit. 
and how profound it seemed was that in this situation with the third temple that has already been, Herod was the equivalent of the false prophet. He made all of the people bow down in the presence of the beast, the beast being Rome. Rome wasn't, you know, necessarily visible there, standing there. It wasn't obvious. They built this temple that was more about their own glory. It was them. It was about them. You know, and here these Jews are going up in here, bowing down at the altar. Well, whose altar was it? Were they on any level, even through sacrifice, honoring and glorifying God at that point? And we see scripturally that God wants obedience, not sacrifice. So I think that, you know, I don't want to overstep and I don't, I don't want to speak for God. But just knowing the Holy Word and knowing God's character, I have to think that the answer to that question is no. No, they were not bowing down to God. They were bowing down to Herod the Great and they were bowing down to Rome. And that, my friends, is a scary thought, but that's just the way that the Lord brought it to my heart and my mind and my understanding. And the fact of the matter is, is that the false prophet, Herod, worked for Rome all along. It just wasn't until the final moments that that was made known. Now, I want to share into this a couple of personal confirmations, ways that the Lord has revealed himself to me. I'm not going to make any comment that is absolute because I have always in my videos communicated against any one of the body communicating anything absolute because that's not what we see scripturally. We are one part of a bigger whole. We receive in part, you know, we know that the word says that the spirit of prophecy is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm not standing here as a prophet. I am standing here as a child of God. I have been shown things. I've been given things. I have sought God on things. I've asked for answers, believing and not doubting that I would receive it. And I have received answers, my friends. You know, again, could there be enemy deception there on some level. It's always possible, but I will say that in order to test these spirits, I don't speak these things out. I don't even talk to my husband about a lot of these things until, you know, I've flushed it all the way out and, you know, these things have come to me. And so it's only after the fact that I speak on these things. And so everything that I share from this point on I just want to submit it for your prayerful consideration for you to take to God and to seek clarity and wisdom and understanding on for yourself. But I feel that he's leading me to share that as I sought him on this, I was actually on a walk when a lot of these things connected to Herod the Great being the equivalent of a false prophet. And we know who the creator, the father of the Jabberwocky is. And so as I was thinking about all of this relative to that, you know, I was praying and I said, God, if this could possibly be true, give me a Bible verse on it. And so there was some more, you know, leadings on my way home. I came home, my husband was upstairs, my daughter was in my room and I sat down. And the minute I did, I heard come into my mind a prophet is not without honor. And so I instantly searched for it on my phone and I kind of saw that verse and what it said and what it meant. And I kind of thought about it for a while and I thought, wow, you know, that is profound. That is very profound. But then I heard again in my spirit, King James Version. And so I had gone down to find my King James Version Bible because it's not one that I use all the time. I mostly use my ESV, but I have used the King James Version in the past. I just hadn't in a while. And so I went, I grabbed it, I flipped it open, and it opened immediately to the page where I had stuck a copy of my left behind letter right almost in the center of the Bible. And when I looked down, I saw the exact verse I was coming to look for, which was in Mark chapter six, verse four, and it reads, but Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin 
and in his own house. My friends, I read that a couple of times thinking about a certain false Jesus that many want to put in Jesus's camp, saying that no one on this earth has ever suffered other than Jesus like that particular man, the father of the poison. And I thought about how profound that was and how there could be trickery involved, major trickery, as it relates to him being the suffering servant, the prophet of God, you know, mistreated. You know, what prophet hasn't been mistreated, abused? That's biblical. And what we see portrayed and how many perceive him to be, even though when it comes to any fruit of the spirit whatsoever, it's lacking. There's nothing there, my friends. A claiming of the name, a claiming of Christianity as a whole, but the fruit of his mouth speaks a completely different story. And furthermore, how could someone who is of God be behind something that has been so devastating and so disastrous? Many people have already lost their lives, my friends. And if you don't know that, then you just have not been looking because the information is everywhere now. And not to mention the fact that it is known and bragged about how it changes the human body. And it is intended and was intended to begin the process of biohacking us. And so after that, less than 20 minutes later, my friends, I pulled up my email just to look. And I think I've mentioned before that I happen to be on that particular mailing list. And I saw what I saw just, you know, literally, because I don't usually look at these things, but it was seen as I scrolled. It was just like right there. Um, this word just almost like jump out at me in a profound way. And what it said was, because this was the very day that he was apparently arraigned for the third time, I believe it was. I don't really keep up with all this, but it's my understanding. And he said, this is what was in the email. It says, I'm writing you this email as I fly back from the belly of the beast. My friends, I almost fell out on the floor. I almost could not even believe my eyes at that moment as I was being given this revelation, seeing these possible connections and how it could, again, imply a lot of things, but also that we are much further along in this timeline than many of us have been thinking. And then I looked at it again and saw that there was a number involved. And that number was 561. Apparently that's how many years they are threatening to imprison him. And we know that God speaks through numbers. And we know that a lot of times these numbers that are significant, a lot of times they're not random. And many of us believe, as do I, that the Lord speaks to us through the Strong's Concordance and those numbers. And with that, I want to read to you what those numbers mean in Strong's. So I didn't document which was Hebrew and which was Greek, but one was it meant over against, opposite, in the view of, or in the presence of. Remember that, my friends, in the presence of. The other one means speech, words, or utterances. And let me read to you now from Revelation 13, a possible connection. And again, I want you to take this to the Lord and you decide. But it says, starting in verse 5, it says, And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Then, starting in verse 11, I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Now, I just want to say again, it exercises all of the authority of the first beast in its presence. Now, I had researched that particular phrase, and it can mean the very same thing as we are all in the presence of God. 
So it doesn't necessarily on any level mean that there is a secondary man standing there. Why would it? Why would the false prophet be necessary if there's a man standing there that had even more power than him? Why wouldn't he just make the people do it? And beyond that, I want to remind you that that word mortal wound was healed. That word wound is used interchangeably throughout scripture as plague. And we just have to understand, like there's so many videos that I've done on this subject, my friends, so many videos that it's like, what did Jesus do? Jesus healed. And for that matter, let's be honest and ask ourselves who healed the beast mortal wound? Would that have been God? Would God himself, is he the only one capable of healing? Or is it possible that even Satan at this late stage in time has that kind of power to call fire from the sky and make amazing things happen that the people are wowed about? Dead men coming alive. Because would God heal the beast of his mortal wound? That's a question we have to ask ourselves, my friends. Okay, so this video is long and I apologize for that, but I feel that the Lord is telling me to put all of this out in one foul swoop. And so if you're watching and if you have watched all this time, then you will see that there is also a dream that the Lord has given me connected to this and I'm gonna share it at this time. I'm gonna read it because I wanna read it exactly as I wrote it. I'm not gonna share into it any Thing absolute. I'm just going to tell you a couple of things that I found on it. I'm just going to ask you to pray about it. But this happened as I was praying that the Lord would tell me two things. Number one, if the SHOT could truly be the biblical MOTV, and as a result of that, that we could possibly be much further along in this thing than we thought and how even potentially things might change on a dime, which I've thought for a long time would happen when the rapture happens. But let's be honest, my friends, none of us know exactly when that is gonna happen and what we might see beforehand. And that's why I'm giving this warning to the body of Christ that we just may be aware and know and have this in the back of our minds, even if we're thinking there's a seven year continuation after these things, I don't know thinking things won't get that bad before we're taken. We have to be open to where the spirit of the Lord leads us. It's very bad to ever think that we're absolute in our understanding. We have to be open to the spirit of the Lord. And so this was the dream that I'd gotten. The Lord speaks to me in riddles and he speaks to me in symbols and dreams as I would have it because I don't feel that I in my flesh could manipulate that. And so this was the dream that happened. And actually there's a verse from Numbers that speaks the reality of this being true, that God speaks in dreams in riddles. And I will place that Bible verse below so you can kind of see that this being symbolic as it is, is biblical. So in this dream, it was as if I was watching a woman on a jet ski driving slash riding it on land. I actually remember watching her at one point go across a pavement road and I was wondering how that would work. There was the sound of metal scraping and she crossed more slowly than on land, but it seemed to be fine. Next, it's as if I have a vision of a slick, and then I have in parentheses, sweaty slash wet, big belly and me having my arms around, quote, him, who I seem to have a memory was my ex fiance. This makes sense because I have always ridden on a jet ski in the past in this way with him driving. Next, it's as if I have this knowing, this troubling memory that I had had sex with my cousin. I'm not gonna tell you his name, but I will tell you his name meaning in a moment because it's very significant. The thought of this made me feel sick, extremely heavy regret. I realized that nothing would or could ever change that fact, that it would always be. I remember thinking, quote, my dirty little secret. Then I remembered thinking that I understood now why or how someone could kill themselves, that there are some things despicable like this that some may feel they are just not able to live with. 
So as I lay there and I tried to recount the details at first, I just lay there and remembered the details. And then when it hit me that this could possibly be the answer to my question related to what I had asked the day before, I quickly started realizing that there was some significance there. I obviously connected the woman riding the jet ski with the beast that rises up out of the sea. And that was the first thing that really hit me. The second thing was as it relates to my ex-fiance, this was something I've shared in the past. It was not a healthy relationship. He is very much an enemy and had been at that particular time in my life. The enemy worked through him. It was an abusive relationship and I have often been given dreams where he carries this symbol of an enemy or the enemy. Furthermore, his name means stone enclosure or stronghold. And next I'm laying there and I am just kind of thinking through the rest of it. It's obviously a little odd, um, the aspect of, of my cousin. I will say very clearly that there was nothing sexual about the dream whatsoever. It was like I said, this knowing just came out of the blue and it was a deep dread and a heavy burden that I felt in the dream. And I'm laying there thinking about all this and I'm trying to realize, okay, like, well, for all of this to be true, obviously there's some things that seem very significant and likely, but where is the SHOT? I have to be able to see the SHOT. And at that point, I felt that the Lord had encouraged me to get up and to look at the name meaning of my cousin. And I was utterly shocked, my friends, when I pulled up that his last name in searched meaning and it meant maker of nails. And so I was just pretty overwhelmed and just without words, honestly. I mean, I, I, I just was just in utter astonishment with this dream. And furthermore, the fact that there was the part about the killing of oneself, I think it is very significant and it needs to be pointed out that in scripture, there was only one person that killed himself and that was Judas. And so it seemed to me that that was possibly a reference to that. And so all in all, it was very significant. What it means beyond the words on the page, I'll let you pray about as it relates to all of this. But to me, like I said, it just confirms to me, my friends, that if this is true and if all of this is from the Lord, then we are way further along than we think and we need to be prepared for that. And with that, I want to speak a little bit more into the concept of tribulation and the concept of rapture quickly. And then I want to also bring just another closing set of scriptures that I really feel solidify this whole message and make it very clear that it kind of connects with everything. And the verse that the Lord led me to that I wouldn't even have found if it wasn't really for his um, supernatural leading. I wrote this verse down by accident, actually. So with that, I just want to say that when the Lord had started speaking to me way back in 2020, and I felt that the Lord was giving me all kinds of amazing supernatural signs and confirmations and really speaking to me that the rapture is near. You know, I had shared that I didn't necessarily at first think of a pre-tribulation rapture. Um, I had at that point believed that there would be a mid-trib, you know, um, or even just kind of post, like meaning just spare wrath only. But when I started getting all of this indication from him, you know, looking around, it's like obviously things weren't ideal in 2020, but they weren't necessarily as bad as most would think either. And so I guess I just felt that, you know, he must be confirming to me that, you know, perhaps there is this seven year tribulation that the church will be spared out of. And while there's the possibility that that is true, I just feel like I need to go on the record and say that that's really no longer where I am with all of it. You know, I've listened to Dr. Barry All and he's beautiful and he encourages the body and there's certainly nothing wrong 
with what he's doing and what, you know, all of the watchmen, you know, um, are doing. And there's beautiful typologies throughout the Bible, but, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can look at things. And so the way that I've really started to look at things is that Jesus' ministry was basically three or three and a half years. And I just can't get to a point where Satan or the Antichrist, because he's cast down at the point of the rapture, I believe, I can't embrace and believe on any level that he would be given twice the amount of time for his ministry that Jesus was given. And so that's just where I am. You know, I can't say for certain what this means as it relates to now. I don't know the future. I just follow the leadings of the Lord and I ask him for revelation and he reveals things to me and gives me glimpses, you know, pieces of the puzzle to share. And so that's what I'm doing. But I think at a bare minimum, you know, post rapture, there would possibly be three and a half, three years left. I just can't see anything beyond that. And at the worst, you know, it could be a pre-wrath rapture. And so what that looks like, again, you know, I don't know. That's something that I have to pray about. That's something that I encourage you to pray about. But as it relates to bringing this whole message home and how I feel the Lord has led me to close this message out, I want to speak back into Luke chapter 13. And that was, like I had said, where I had referred earlier about Jesus referring to Herod as the fox as it related to him, you know, potentially coming after him to kill him. And the beginning of that, before that, starting in verse 22, Jesus tells this very significant parable. It is the narrow door parable. So many within the churches want to completely write this parable off. They want to misinterpret it. They want to say that the people who are the workers of lawlessness are the ones that are not by grace and grace alone, thinking that there's anything whatsoever required of a truly believing, professing Christian whose heart has been changed by the power of God and in whom the Holy Spirit has come to reside. And the reality, my friends, is that these scriptures speak very clearly otherwise, because he said it's a narrow road that leads to life, and few find it. The wide road leads to destruction. And, and with that, I want to pick up in verse 25 and read for a moment. He says, once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, and so there's obviously a sin notation there by saying evil. Other translations say you worker of lawlessness. And so that is obviously uh, a word that is directly connected to and means sin and utter disbelief, speaking only with your mouth, but your actions going against everything that is of God. Because the word of God says that we are to be holy as he is holy and even perfect as he is perfect. No one can be perfect, but we can certainly, as disciples, walk in his truth and try to follow along in his footsteps and try to live perfectly as he would have us to do as Lord and master of our lives. And going on from that, he says that he will tell those people to depart from him. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and all the prophets of the kingdom of God, but you yourselves are cast out. And people will come from the east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. And from there, he gives a lament over Jerusalem. And it continues at verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. 
And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. And then it continues in verse 34 saying, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. My friends, as it relates to everything I've shared with you in this video, it's important that that word fox, as it relates to Herod and the temple that was built, is connected to this scripture that is a little further down where he says, behold, your house is forsaken. I was led to look that word house up and I was astonished, like I said, because I even found the scripture because I had written it down wrong. And so it became very clear that the Lord had led me literally to 1335. And that word for house, Strong's 3624, it can mean a house, strictly an inhabited house. It can also refer to any building whatsoever. It can refer to a palace. It can refer to the house where God was regarded as present, meaning the tabernacle. It can be used of the heavenly sanctuary, and it has been used as it relates to the body of Christians, meaning the church, as pervaded by the spirit and power of God. And finally, it can actually also represent or be used as any dwelling place, including the human body as the abode of demons that possess it. And it's very interesting, my friends, that this is the third bullet point under that listing. It is actually notated by a lowercase c, and it continues under that bullet point, lowercase c, saying it can also be used related to tents and huts and later nests, stalls, lairs of animals. Universally, the place where one has fixed his residence, one's settled abode or domicile. And Luke 1335 is actually reference listed in this section. And so the interesting thing to me was obviously that we know that Jesus was born and he was laid in a manger. Most people think that that was some sort of um, stable or stall, some place where animals were kept. And beyond that, my friends, that is very clear that this dwelling place, this house, if you will, that Jesus could have been speaking to, even into the future, was talking about the future temple, which would be the human body. But as it is, it seems very clear that even though Jesus didn't call the Jews out and say, you've sold out to a false prophet, to an antichrist. You've allowed the holy temple to be torn down. And here I am standing in this temple of an antichrist. What he really did say was, behold, your house is forsaken. And maybe he didn't say that. And I believe he didn't say that because at that point, it was really no longer about that physical place anymore. It was about him. It was about his physical human body that he as God took on his earthly tent at that point and how he would continue to dwell from that point forevermore. No longer in anything built of materials, wood, brick, stone, but as human flesh, just as God created man to be in his own image. My friends, I don't take this message lightly at all. Obviously, it's been a long message, and if you have made it this far, then I appreciate your listening, and I also appreciate you taking your questions to the Lord, even though I'm always happy if I can help to help you with some of this stuff. I'm just very limited with what I can share because 
I'm sharing all that I have right now. And I'm just going to ask you to take the rest of it to the Lord. If there is any more that the Lord brings to me on this topic, I will certainly bring it because I'll tell you that, like I had said in the beginning, this was not a video that I wanted to do, friends. This was just not, okay? And I was running from it a little bit, and the Lord shook me pretty hard yesterday to get me to a point where I was actually willing to do this. And um, here I am. I have to be obedient to Him, and I want to be obedient to Him. But, you know, I think my hesitation with bringing it is because it does open up a lot of questions, you know, related to what does that really mean? I believe that it's very possible that there will be something physical just like the golden eagle that comes. But beyond that, as it relates to the place that this leaves those people that have gone there, who have partaken of this thing, you know, either knowingly, you know, that either they were like Eve and they were deceived, or maybe they were like Adam and they weren't deceived, but they just went along because Eve was doing it. You know, what does it mean for them? And while I don't have that answer at all, I will tell you that I feel like there is definitely hope in that case. You know, I'm not one who believes that we are to pronounce any kind of judgment, final judgment on anyone. I know that there are some channels out there that do that, and that seems to be what they've received, but that's just not what I'm receiving and what I believe that the Lord would have me share at this point. What I think that it does say is that just like I had said, the Lord had told me and what I had released in a previous message was that I believed that the shot was the type and the shadow of the MOTB for the Gentiles and it was the test. And I still believe that that's true. This is just a little bit of an extra layer on to that. And while it may or may not be something that someone could be completely forgiven of, I think biblically what we see is that if it is the official MOTB, then at a minimum, we can see that those people will not be in the millennial kingdom and that those people will be standing in front of God and will have to answer for themselves and the great white throne judgment. And so beyond that, my friends, you know, I'm just going to ask you to search the Lord on the subject for yourself. I will also refer you to Deuteronomy chapter four. If you are very conflicted and maybe want to look into some things that potentially speak into some of these subjects on your own study time. But beyond that, that's really all that I'm able to share. And I hope that it helps you. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and guide you and fill you with his perfect grace, overflowing.